Welcome everyone to Harnessing Artificial Intelligence. This is a live webcast brought to you by Monash Tech Talks, which is brought to you through the Monash University Faculty of Information Technology. It's great to have you here this evening. Now, my name is John Whittle. I am the Dean of the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. And joining me this evening are two very illustrious guests. First of all, we have Professor Ray Bunteen, who is an AI researcher in the faculty. And then we have Dr. Catherine Lopez, who is currently head of data science and machine learning at AGL Energy. And in fact, Catherine completed a PhD at Monash University in machine learning. So together with Ray and Catherine this evening, we're going to be covering a range of topics that's going to explain to you some of the basics and some of the intricacies of artificial intelligence. And here's our agenda for the evening. So we're going to talk a little bit about the basics of AI. What is this thing called artificial intelligence? Then we're going to look at what Catherine and Ray really feel are some of the key innovations in artificial intelligence. We're going to talk next about how artificial intelligence is changing business. And then we're going to have plenty of time at the end for a Q&A where you get to ask some of your burning questions to ask to our panel about what artificial intelligence is and what it can and cannot do. Now, before we start, we would like to know where you are today to get a sense of who our audience is. So if you're viewing this live, there is a live poll pop-up window on your screen. So if you could please select from the options there right now. Thank you very much. So we'll give you a few seconds to fill that out. And while we're waiting for you to fill that out, we'd also like to know that you can submit questions throughout the webcast. And you do this by clicking the blue hand icon in the top corner of your screen. So. I'm just viewing some of the results of your polling right now. Now, not surprisingly, a large proportion of you are joining us here in Australia. About 68% of you are in Australia. Um, but we've also got people in other parts of the world as well. So a substantial portion of you are actually in Asia, with about 30% in Asia. So it's great to have you all here with us this evening, no matter where you are in the world. Fantastic. Let's get started. So artificial intelligence, or AI, this is a topic that is discussed just about everywhere nowadays. You can barely turn on the radio or watch the TV or go on social media without hearing these words, artificial intelligence. But what actually is it? Let's ask our panel. Ray, what is artificial intelligence? So AI is skill acquisition. The idea is the system must be able to learn new skills. Now, the earliest, one of the earliest, most famous examples was chess playing. What that system did was play against itself. In doing so, it got better and better. It learnt a skill. Uh, in skill acquisition, we need to both recognise things in our environment and we need to act. So we need to make plans and make decisions. So it's that combination of recognition and planning for an artificial intelligence that makes it work. Great, Ray. So you, you hinted at it a little bit there, but obviously there's been quite a long history of AI. People often talk as though it's a new technology. Mm. You talked about chess playing, which has a, a history with AI. Can you talk us a little bit through what the, some of the history is, where, where it all started? How long has it been going? <clears throat> is it a new thing? Certainly not. Uh, started in the 50s and 60s, but Back then, when I look at what they were doing then, it does seem amazingly primitive. But they, it took until the, probably the mid-80s when they started building systems that had a, a modicum of intelligence. Everything before then was quite simple. Um, but the intelligent systems in the 80s were really just following simple scripts. And it was only in the 90s when they started building, doing learning, and intelligence. Um, but the big, the big date, 2011, which is when deep learning hit, and that was a whole new capability that we could talk at length. 
about. But that raised the bar in capability and changed everything. Great, absolutely. Mm -hmm. let's, let's just talk about that deep learning thing for a minute. But, but before we do, um, <clears throat> deep learning is really part of machine learning. Yeah. And Catherine, you're the head of data science and machine learning at AGL. So what is machine learning to you? So um, machine learning is um, one set of these computer algorithms where we divide it into three areas where supervised learning, technically unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So this is, there are overlapping between AI, machine learning, and deep learning. So the deep learning actually is what I see, you know, when I heard that system made a big um, improvement where it, a machine le a deep learning is in part of where you build multiple layers and based on the unsupervised and the supervised learning where you can actually implement, enable the learning through reinforcement learning, for mm. example. And uh, I think that system, so theoretically, that is basically what we answer, say, the machine learning. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, I want to you know actually add one point on them. I completely agree with deep learning is one way the AI made a big leap. Mm. Where when I say um, the GPU and the cloud computing mm. actually enabled deep learning become reality to be deployed, mm. to be implemented into applications. Sure. So, so I guess yeah. what you're saying is that there's really three things that have made the, the current crop of AI systems much better than the kind of early systems that you talked about, Ray. And that is, first of all, this thing called deep learning, which is essentially a much more complex form of machine learning, which means that we can solve much larger problems. Secondly, the fact that there's the, an availability of big data in a way that there wasn't the availability before. And third, third, yeah. thirdly, the kind of compute power with cloud yes. computing yeah. and so forth. And if we take those three things together, then that's why artificial intelligence today is different from artificial intelligence in the 1950s. Is that a great summary? Uh, summary? Uh, yes. Wait, I, yeah. I should uh, be uh, answering uh, the uh, questions. Uh, yes. Asking <laughs> the questions. Great, excellent. So let's move on to the, the second portion mm. of our webcast today then. And that is really about innovations in artificial intelligence. So here I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, we've, we've heard about what AI is, we've heard about what deep learning is, big data and so forth, but what can it do? And I'm wondering perhaps Catherine first, if you could share with us maybe one or two examples of some really exciting innovations in AI that you've seen, you know, things that make you get out of bed in the morning and say, yes, I want to go to AGL Energy and continue to work on this thing called artificial intelligence. Well, uh, I would say um, this topic certainly is a topic, uh, it, it's my passion, and you know, which is make me get up like what I like to do. It doesn't necessarily say which company it is, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, uh, well, let's touch on something where um, it's a broad in the energy industry, mm -hmm. where um, we were just talking about it's a dis distributed energy. You think about it as um, uh, what we call virtual power plant, where also you have a different battery installed and you have your grid energy coming, and also you have your um, electric vehicle, for example, right? How are you going to actually, now people get used to the GPS, well, you know, the Google map, where you don't have to think about it, where you're going. Now, just imagine that what I can imagine is, well, you know, how I'm going to be efficiently use my en the energy consumed by my household, well, in a larger scale, and you know, within Australia, then we all orchestrated, we optimized, optimized, and then so to avoid the blackout, and more being more efficient. So that is the one thing where I can think about. There is you can apply the deep learning on the image recognition through the image recognition, and then see where you can see the you know the uh, solar panels on the top and how much energy. But you look at the forecasting from the weather forecast. You can optimize where should be the right place and now what the voltage can be generated. So this is a, a entire space where you can apply different type of 
deep learning, supervised learning, machine learning, and mm. that's the beauty about you harness mm. everything. Then the basic computation, you know, power plus the big data enabled, then you can actually harness. That's where it's called harness artificial intelligence. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Right, uh, harnessing artificial intelligence yes. that we harness energy. In yes. Fact. So I, um, energy is not my field, so I don't know much about energy. I, I use energy, obviously, but that's about as much as I know. So if, if I'm summarizing what you're saying, are you saying then that you can use artificial intelligence to move energy around from the source of that energy to the consumers of that energy in a more efficient way than we can currently do? Is that Absolutely. what you're saying? Okay. Absolutely. And what's the role of deep learning in that? How does that work when you're trying to optimize this energy flow? All right, so um, deep learning, where basically the role of deep learning right now, and um, we, are, have, we haven't really applied to this, what sh the, the project we're talking about. But the deep learning we have used is um, um, through the one area where you can see it often artificial intelligence techniques often applied separately in different areas. So through the image recognition area. So yes. that's the domain where we apply deep learning, where you have the GPU enabled through the entire um, map. You can look at many of this. Um, the comp so basically, if you want to detect how many solar panels and on the rooftop across the entire Victoria, if you don't have the deep learning and you don't have the computation power, and you will uh, run for days or weeks. But now you could easily run for, you know, hour. Mm -hmm. And so which going to enable you, and also the it will because this is not a static status; it's constant changing. Mm -hmm. So that's where you know, this is a one area we can talk about it. So you're saying you can uh, take satellite images, for example, yes. and you can apply these techniques to um, get a faster recognition of where things like solar panels are located, and then you can feed that into your, your planning uh, algorithms to maximize the efficiency of the system. Yes, and that's a ma there are many ways of doing this. So, but it depends on your objective and what's your goal for your business, mm. where the value is. However, that mm. is a one use case. Hmm. And it sounds to me from what you're saying that there's a system level change that is needed here. So it's it's one thing to talk about a specific algorithm that might detect um, images or, or certain features in images, but that's got to be combined with other AI techniques that are um, operating in a different part of the business. So as you know, as a, as a large organization, how do you get all those different bits of AI to work together at the system level? Well, that's what you call, um, well, this is uh, enterprise level. Uh -huh. The enterprise level, and you will have on the, um, well, basically unit level, then you, a different operating models. However, when we um, look at, we have to have a very clear, that is the, that is a goal for this project. Mm -hmm. What is the scale? Mm -hmm. And we're looking at, and are we build, we have to build it incrementally. Mm -hmm. However, we have the large you know, picture as the end goal for us mm -hmm. to know, okay, this is on the enterprise level, that should be a platform, or should be the technology all integrate together. Mm -hmm. And however, how we leverage, yeah. so it, you can build separately, or you can build, you know, uh, create integration later on. However, this is the up to the design. Great, so yeah. ent enterprise level AI, I think mean, that's a great uh, uh, soundbite and challenge. There. Challenge, Absolutely. yes. Now, Ray, you've, uh, you've worked in lots of different um, areas of AI and lots of different applications yeah. of AI. So what is it that gets you up in the morning and keeps you going to Monash University? You know, you've been working on this for decades. Yeah. So what's the really exciting stuff that well, you're working on now? Not necessarily what I'm doing, but what I'm seeing. Um, computers can now, with AI, say, generate poetry. Uh, they can generate art. Um, even though it is quite degree, they're copying what others have done. They can take images. They can turn my frown into a smile. They could, and it'll be done soon, they could generate a new movie with the Three Stooges, all again, completely automate them. Wow. Um, there's many things that can be done uh, medical science is, and well, actually, any profession may change. So, in medicine, there's areas like radiology 
which is where the specialist looks at an image and, and makes a note on what they see. Is there a cancer? Is there a tumour there? Um, that kind of thing, the, the AI is already very good at and beating human experts. Um, so there's, there's many fields that are going to completely change. I think that's a really interesting point you raise because mm. one of the arguments that people often have about our artificial intelligence is that it's going to be able to automate the routine tasks that people carry out, but it's not going to be able to automate those creative tasks, and that's what separates artificial intelligence from us as human beings. But what you're actually saying is that the, it can possibly even be creative as well. If not now, then at some point in the future. Well, there's a point where creative is small amounts of creative is copying. It's big creative that's difficult. Um, the other thing is computers are not humans. I know it's an obvious statement, but... Not yet. But, uh, <laughs> but computer, the AI does not have human experience. It does not have empathy. So it can't understand the complications of say a drug addict. Uh, there's just so many issues where a computer, an AI could not touch at the moment. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I couldn't let you get away um, finishing this segment of the webcast without talking about some of your own work because you are actually doing some very exciting work. I know, for example, that you've got a new project ah. with Google mm. on something called the world's first suicide monitoring system that's using AI yeah. in a very important uh, context. Maybe you can tell us about that. So we're working with a, a group called Turning Point, Professor Dan Lubman, and we get ambulance records and they get probably maybe a million a year from across all the states. And the idea is we're going to teach an AI system to recognize in those records um, different cases and different kinds of uh, uh, suicide. Um, I've got to point out that a key, key players in that task are the current human experts because we can never replace them. We'll be working with them in making them work a lot faster and more accurate. And, and so that's the task. But what we're doing is taking a short written record from the ambulance folks and turning it into a, a bit of code that says this person attempted suicide. This person looked like they attempted mm -hmm. suicide but wasn't serious about it. Things like that. Fantastic. And I think you, you raised two really critical points there about how we view AI at Monash University. Mm. First of all, it's about the human in the loop. We're not trying to replace humans by AI. Absolutely. And secondly, the kind of application that you're talking about is really a positive social story, an mm. AI for social good, which is in our mission statement at the Monash Data Futures Institute at Monash. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to move on to the next segment of this webcast now, which is all about harness harnessing artificial intelligence for business. Before we do, though, I just, I've just i noticed on my location poll that we've got 4% of you now joining us from Europe. So welcome to all oh. our European viewers. It must be uh, a, you know, a, not a great time of day to be following our webcast, so a special welcome to you. And also a reminder to everyone out there listening to send us through your burning questions because we're going to have the second segment of this webcast where you get the chance to really quiz our two panelists about AI and what the implications are for business and society. So let's turn to artificial intelligence for business. Now there was a recent McKinsey report that came out that said that um, it did a survey and that over half of all businesses are now using artificial intelligence in some form. So I'll ask, I'll ask this to Catherine. You're in the business world. You're at the kind of leading edge of this sector. I mean, how important is AI for businesses? Is this something they really need to pay attention to, or is this just the latest fad that's going to have gone away in a few years? Well, um, I'm very optimistic about AI. Um, it, not because of my passion, because I do believe that is certainly going to dramatically change the way of we live our life. And the way of we live our life is 
um, you know, hands in hands together is business together. So the BIN is absolutely on the way of they want to use artificial intelligence. However, I think there is a big learning curve and for uh, the level of maturity of the business to adapt the artificial intelligence and to make it to, to can be deployed and it can be in a scaled version and monitored and to do it with ethical practice. Mm. That is a part where I think that this is what I say, the make it big challenge of um, as a business to um, use artificial intelligence. I, and I think you're right that, we're, that there's a maturity path that yes. we're on right now. So where, where do you think Australian business currently is? Do you think they're 5% along the AI maturity curve, 10%, 50%? Does it vary across different industries? Which, I, which industries are more advanced? I think it absolutely varies. Varies mm. a lot between different um, sessions, sections, and the business domain. And, it's, and also even within one business domain. Mm. And they could be you know, in one um, banking domain, and there'd be some division, and you could you know, um, made their way ahead of other divisions and where, you know, they have the digital enabled, they have a very clear business target to reach and all. I think this varies a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you mentioned ethics, yes. um, which is um, very important. And also I think more, more broader than ethics, whether we need um, new legal regulations around the use of AI, um, the responsible use of AI. So Ray, I'm wondering, uh, you know, as a professor of AI, whether you have any um, advice that you could give to companies out there about how could they use AI responsibly? So th there's a lot of issues. Um, there's the existing operating environment. So for instance, in the medical field, uh, a physician, a doctor has to be responsible. They can't let someone else take that responsibility. So, so an AI system cannot make critical decisions in that environment. We'd have to change our laws to allow that to happen. Um, to, and then in terms of the systems, the AI systems, currently there's no real way to instill ethics or responsibility in them. And to a degree, they're, a, they're, a, they're just a mirror. Whatever data they're trained on, they will throw back at you in, in some way or another. So we need to be, we need as a community, we need to figure out how to develop ethics into a computer. You know, the, the, the Hollywood has made a big deal about Asimov's three laws of robotics, but oh God, how the hell would they be implemented? That's completely unrealistic. We need uh, systems and, and ways of doing things to make an AI ethical. That's a, that's a big job. So people are working on that currently. Um, and I suppose that coming back to your, your suicide prevention project yeah. earlier, you must be having to think about some of these big questions in that project. So how are you planning to develop AI responsibly in that context? So in our case, we're not, be, we're not responsible for any particular decisions. What we're doing is making the collection of data more efficient and the responsibility we have in there is where we're doing self-checking. So we have to put in the, into the system the ability to check itself with the humans um, so that we have at any one point in time, we have a reliable metric of how well the system is going. And that's something we have to put in or, well, they won't trust us. So you could almost think about it that um you know, you're, you're relying on existing human yeah. expertise or existing regulations yeah. to make the hard decisions. Mm. The AI is almost in a containment field, so it can produce better data or That's produce right. data more efficiently, but it's within that containment mm. field, so it can't start making decisions it, independently without that human expertise. You have to be talking about auto automated driving, so an automatic driving system, mm. before you can see the many just just problems with these, the potential there. I mean, if you've got an automatic driver and the automatic driving, you're sitting in the back seat and you're drunk, 
what, who's responsible? Can you get fined for drunk driving in that case? Uh, there are just so many difficult legal issues that people would have to settle and make the systems well enough. Um, I, I completely agree. And uh, that is the one thing I have been thinking um, in lately. See, look, when we practice in a certain field where people ask me about artificial intelligence of the job, I always say, how are we going to uh, provide a certificate for the AI system you use. So if I'm a, a doctor practitioner mm. or an IO practitioner of a, even a plumber, I need to be certified, mm. right? Yes. And, and then can, is there any of the AI solution or uh, technology mm. piece you just say, okay, I let it this machine and based on some of data of could be biased, but I don't have a way to explain to you and then to make the decision. Yeah, so yeah. There's, there's, we have to develop these procedures. Yes. You know, where the system itself has to undergo a test. Yes. They've got to do the medical test. Um, uh, you know, the, things like that. But, but for a medical test, that's only part of practicing medicine. Yeah. There's also the people. Yes. And then so, you know, that's, that's the part where, mm. you know, we could go yeah, yeah. on. I, I, yeah. I think it's an interesting point to talk about certified AI or certified, <laughs> certified, oh. certified, en yeah. certified engineers who are developing the AI. Yeah, I, yes. wish, I wish you luck with it, however, because I'm a software engineer and we have much more basic technology that can also put um, people's lives in danger. Um, and yes, mm -hmm. for things like aircraft, there are regulations mm -hmm. and certification authorities uh -huh. around this. But the, uh, the, the industry hasn't yet reached a point where it will actually hold individual software engineers accountable for their mistakes. And maybe we do need to move towards that direction for wow. AI. Oh, and, and so I, I put some, I post uh, another tip, actionable tip I learned from the previous chief data scientist for Obama um, government. Uh -huh. And uh, that is the one thing I said, I'm going to practice now, start with a higher you know, for people for my team, they're machine learning engineer, data scientist, ethics, mm -hmm. practice ethics, and that is a part of the interview. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me ask you another ethical question, though, because one ethical question is whether we should be doing this at all. So, and so let's talk about jobs. So there's this famous Ooh. famous study that came out in 2013 from Oxford University that said in 25 years, 47% of all jobs that we have today would be automated away by AI. Mm. Is that true? Should we be worried about that? Are, are webcast presenters going to be automated away? Will there be a robot sat here talking to you in 25 years time about the future of AI? Mm. Well, I've also heard the number 30%. So, and, but the key thing I can tell you now is the tasks are going to change. Yes. For most people, the work they do will change. There'll still be a doctor, a GP who will be working with you, but they'll have a really clever assistant supporting them. So things will change, but there will be some... Uh, loss of jobs. Yeah, and I think it's true to say that, you know, if you look throughout history, any technology or any development, whether it's AI or not, mm. has always meant that the jobs oh. will change and, and it often can lead to new jobs. So yeah. in fact, the Australian government just brought out a report that said there's, there's, there's going to be 160,000 new jobs in AI because wow. we need people trained in these technologies. Industrial revolution, late 1700s, green revolution, which was agriculture, 1950s, we're now at the AI or machine learning revolution. It'll be as big and huge for society, but we have to wait. Absolutely. I think that's a good point to move on to our Q&A part of the webcast. So just a reminder to all of you out there that if you want to ask a question, there is a blue hand icon um, on your screen. You can enter your question there. We want lots of great questions, so please uh, get those questions in. And we do have a first question, which actually relates to a topic that we were talking about earlier. And this is from uh, Fabrice who says, I'm new to AI, can you please briefly differentiate between deep learning and machine learning and how they are presently applied in real world scenarios? So we did touch upon this earlier, but maybe let's go a little bit back to basics. So Ray, can you give us a kind of 101 
basic description of machine learning for somebody who you encounter in the street who's never heard of AI, oh, you know, or, or maybe explain to them how a neural network works. So m machine learning is where you're giving a machine examples, training cases, and it's it's going to automatically learn whatever it is you want it to learn. So it's learning from examples, um, and there are different ways of doing it. Um, in the older times, we had a set of particular formulas and methods and algorithms we would use for machine learning. It was quite restricted. Um, and there's a technical restriction on that that statisticians understand. But deep learning came along, and they, re they removed all restrictions. With deep learning, you can learn any class of functions, or you can learn any complex recognition uh, algorithm. And deep learning is, is more powerful in that, that sense, though the learning component of deep learning is actually very simple and repetitive. It's just that the whole system has been put together so that it works efficiently on fast hardware, and so that the people who design a deep learning system, they're architects. They're architects that put up a structure and then they run some data in an algorithm and it'll flesh out the, the details. So modern uh, deep learning is really an architectural uh, activity. Absolutely. Whereas old machine learning, it was really a statistical computational skill. It was quite a different a much more mathematical thing. But they still, the basic laws of science still apply to both of them. So there's no, you, you know, we still understand deep learning as a machine learning object. I actually came across a nice analogy to explain uh, machine learning recently, and that's when you, when you order coffee. So for those of you out there um, not in Melbourne, you may not know that Melbourne has the best coffee in the world by far. So if you've never been to Australia, never <laughs> been to Melbourne, come here and to get a really, really good long black. Um, but the, you can actually use this to explain machine learning. So there's essentially two different ways you can get a computer to automate something. The first way is you could give it a set of rules. So you could give it a set of rules that says, um, if it's before 7 a.m. in the morning and I'm in the center of Melbourne, then I would like a long black. If it's after 2 p.m., then I would like a cup of tea or something like that. And a machine can do a certain amount based on those rules. Whereas machine learning is what you described, Ray, where instead of giving it rules, you give it examples. So the machine might collect thousands of examples of when I've ordered coffee in particular places, what time of day it is, how it is, how it is feeling, and from that it will automatically learn those oh. rules. Mm. So that's, that's my favorite easy to understand explanation of what machine learning is. Mm. We'd have to extend it to, uh, to, to tackle deep learning, but I think that's for another day. We have another great question here. And now this question comes from Sean. And this relates back to our discussion around ethics and regulations. So Sean asks us, how far away are we from a governing body required to sign off on AI programs which affect our everyday living? Um, when, in other words, when do we imagine laws that will govern AI being implemented? Catherine. Actually, uh, I think I can answer this question where uh, I think last week there was a framework or discussion has been uh, brought into the consultation period well, for AI ethics framework. So that is a good initiative where this one step forward for um, government to look at the AI ethics. Well, they're given that in Australia they already have a privacy you know, um, rules and uh, by ACCC, and there are uh, also other uh, data governance framework. However, I do think that compared to Europe, like CDPR, compared to US, they already have different states, has different uh, laws, or maybe the regulation have been, um, you know, be implemented. We, we, we do, I think we have urgency to speed up. Absolutely, yeah. and, and you're quite right. The Australian government recently brought out its principles for ethical AI, and I think yeah. there were eight 
principles mm. in that document. However, uh, and, and other governments around the world have brought out sim similar things. One of the ob observations I would make about it, though, is that these eight principles are quite high level. So I think one of the principles is around the fact that AI algorithms should promote human well-being. Now, you know, something like that, Ray, how do we actually implement that, though? And, you know, again, in your suicide prevention mm. approach, you, human well-being is, is clearly critical. You but. need a, a management system. Mm. It, it can't be the AI system that's, that's automatically doing this. You, you need a, a certification, like you're saying. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Where, where people come in and they, and they observe the system and they understand how the system's put together. Great. Mm. We'll go to another question. I, I like this question. This, is, this question is from Ran Mali. Now, Ran Mali is asking us, first of all, they say, uh, nice webinar with an exclamation mark. So we like that. More, more of that, please, <laughs> audience. But Ran Mali is actually asking us, you know, we've talked a lot about future potential disruptive power of AI, but let's just talk a little bit about what AI has already done. So, Catherine, can you give us an example, a concrete example that we can all understand of something that AI has done that has kind of changed the world or has, has, has changed business in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do with, without AI? Um, I think that's your field. I mean, that's the education oh. field. Yes. <laughs> and I, I should be talking a bit to this. Is because, well, I can observe this from um, being, I was in, you know, when I was in academia and now looking at the children, there I have children now, they are consuming this customized education, distance learning. The AI and the plus that uh, was so I th I think for me and uh, that is um, uh, education is a very important for uh, a daily life mm. and that's not for only for you know the um, K to twelve that's uh, all tertiary education for the lifelong journey you mm. enable people where from a rural area and can learn different languages and also you can um, the, some of um, I know some people from here, they even have a piano tutor through the mm. internet and customized mm. for you to enable your, and you know, to improve your technique. So I think that is a really a game changing mm. uh, in terms in education. So personalized learning. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Ray, Ray, what's your favorite example of AI um, that's actually happened? Well, the one I always go back to is the, uh, the radiologist where the medical specialist looks at an image and figures out some of the problems in that image, cancer, infection, uh, and that is now being done very well. Hmm. Um, uh, though I also love the, the things you can do with images as well. Um, recognition, for instance, uh, in, there are some places where you pay with your train ticket by your face. It just recognizes you and it can uh, give you a ticket. And that can happen in some places. So that's AI. And, and of course, that brings us back full circle to the ethical uh -huh. considerations. <laughs> Whenever we talk about face yes, detection, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> interestingly, you know, I know that, for example, in California and San Francisco, uh, the local government there has banned uh, the use of face detection algorithms yeah. by any local government service, yeah. which is um, one of the examples of where AI has already mm. been regulated yeah, out yeah. there in the real world. Um, but let's let's move on to this question um, from Jun. Um, so this is actually more a question of, about education. So, I mean, I've already said that in Australia, the government thinks that there are at least another 160,000 AI engineers that will be needed in the next few years. Um, you can find similar statistics across the world of the skills gap that there is. Um, and John is asking, you know, I, I'm interested to work in AI. Um, I'm an adult and computer programmer. What options do I have to get into this industry? So actually, maybe we'll start with Catherine not, and ask you a version of that question, which is, you know, when you're hiring people to work in your business, what are the gaps in their knowledge that you typically come across? And how can you help them, give them some advice to go and fill those gaps uh, before they go out into the marketplace? 
That's very interesting. I answered this question um, in last showcase a month ago, and the first thing I asked them say, "Can you do a gap analysis on your skill sets?" Mm. Right. And but most important thing for me is um, in the data science and um, in machine learning, and then that's is I find people who um, don't. So as actually as re, the first thing touched on as AI is learning. And in your curiosity, mm. ask the right questions. So you so can not machine learning, but human learning. Yes, <laughs> yes. Mm. And I mm. certainly, I, I think, I think certainly say, people, you understand why you want to come to do this work. And I find not actually, um, not uh, many of them cannot answer this question. Mm. And understand why, mm. and uh, and given that you understand why, to answer the why, you need to understand the field. So there is a so it's a good way for them to bring them, you know, to understand the gap, right? And it's, however, during the hiring process, which is I quite often see, um, people actually, is the curiosity and also mm. a problem solving. So the specific language you can, mm. it, perhaps you have the language skill from one, you can transfer to learn another one very quickly. However, the, the way of systematically, all the curiosity, all the ask the right questions, solve the problem, and also is there, is there a guide rail we should follow? Is this ethical? Does this create harm? I think that is the part where um, it is exciting, challenging, and for people who work in the artificial intelligence. Yeah, so it's, it's less about um, particular technical skills that people could c come up with, but more about what their attitude to learning um, mm. new skills, what their mindset about kind of responsible use of AI, those are the kind of things that you're looking for when you hire people. I think that's the foundation, yeah. fundamental yeah. basic which and yeah. the other, of course, and I say, look, you know, you have the program. There are different programs and you know, from different university. You will take on the courses and to learn to brush up mm -hmm. what the skills you need to use for the particular. But this field change so mm. fast. Yeah. Mm. So that's you learn. But these last three months, perhaps going to out of stage in another two months yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and Ray, I mean, if there is somebody out there that's thinking about maybe taking a, a course, whether that's a traditional course in a university or some kind of online short course, I mean, what are the kind of, um, where, where should they start with that? What are the basic things that you think they should start to learn? I, I get... think at the beginning, they need to get their basic programming uh, with a modern language, uh, programming and understanding of, of general AI. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of AI, so at some stage you will have to maybe specialise, uh, whether it be language or, or vision, um, machine learning, there's many different aspects you have to get into, but uh, um, I think the first thing is getting your programming skills down. Um, and then understanding different kinds of AI, there's a, there's a bunch of good courses you can do. Um, Great. All right. And um, we'll go to another question. Um, oh, this is a good one. And it's actually just popped up. I was going to ask a different question, but this question is so good. This is from Chris um, that I'm going to ask this question instead. So this is actually about the startup ecosystem in Australia. And we, you know, it's, given that we have a global audience here, we could um, broaden this if we want. But um, Chris asks us, can you say more about what the AI startup ecosystem in Australia is, what its level of maturity is? Um, what are the not notable startups with innovative AI applications? Ray, I think you're a good person to answer that one. Um, uh, not sure about that. Um, I do know there are some startups we hear, see, and hear some of them. It's not the same. Uh, there's a lot more money being spent in some overseas places, noticeably America and China. But uh, uh, we have some startups here in um, Sydney and Melbourne. They're the ones I'm familiar with. But that's really about all I can say. We see some. Uh, activity through our students. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine, do you see any startup activity from your vantage point? Uh, or would you like to? Yeah. Well, I, I'm part of the startup community. Ah, there Good. we go. We yeah. have the, the um, exact right uh, person to answer your question, folks. And so, I'll, I'll put it that way, and I work in the corporate, but I, I'm oh, sometimes I call myself an entrepreneur. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's just a part. So, um, 
the information what I have, I mean, the, the market what I have seen, um, there is certainly we cannot compare to the Silicon Valley mm. and to many other places. Well, their pockets will, Victoria government in, is encouraging, um, you know, the startup ecosystem. Well, actually today there is a summit or is a conference um, on the startup. Oh. Yeah, and so today, we should be there. Tomorrow. Yes, okay. actually today, tomorrow, so two days. And okay, if we I can go get it right. Um, and Sydney has this um, mm. a, a big around. I think uh, that's uh, Atlassian uh, is a main yeah. you know, owner or it's a main driver to push together with uh, um, Sydney Uni University of Sydney and to create this ecosystem. And something is happening. Actually, happened in. Um, um, Brisbane as well. Oh. Mm. So there is a um, in the. Um, uh, I, I, but what I can see is is um, I think uh, just like many other things, as in the tech um, industry, we are behind, and also the confidence. So basically, it's the confidence of investors. How willing, how much risk they are willing to invest on this startup. Mm. And um, so that is in my entire thing is we still also we have a lot of talents. However, a lot of actually really good talent and them, you know, they find, OK, we don't have an environment. So I'm moving to U.S. Very to true. start. Right. Very true. So I think that is um, <coughs> what I have mm. seen. But uh, I could be just uh, in looking at small different angle. I, I won't have the full picture. Yeah. But do remember the U.S. and those sorts of places, they're just a lot bigger. So what we see are the successes, hmm. you know. So I wouldn't argue it's necessarily easier or harder here. Mm -hmm. It's just that the big successes, the really big ones, will come from those places where they have much more money and, and they're able to get rolling quicker. But we still have some very good successes coming out of Australia. Oh, yeah, mm. and I, I agree. Not yeah. necessarily easier over there. Yes. It's easier at a certain level once you, you know, once you really get going, then you'll have money thrown at you in a ridiculous amount. Yeah. I think the community is bigger. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah. is a where um, you can see a lot of, um, mm. you know, so, but the failure rate also is high. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I have a feeling that it's, it's emerging in Australia now, and I know there is already some um, tech hubs that include AI companies in the CBD here in Melbourne. The Australian Computer Society is trying to get an AI hub launched. You know, um, companies that I think of when I think of um, startup successes, I think of companies like Live Tiles that have worked a lot with Microsoft on office productivity tools but are putting AI in their underlying technology. Um, even, even, you know, not so much small startups, but big companies like Woodside are building a lot of kind of data science tools and AI tools in-house and actually mm. using them um, in big ways a across their organization. So Any big company yeah, must be using that's AI. Right, that's right. Really, exactly. it's essential. That's right. So it's, it's, I think it's beginning to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the money was mentioned. And if you look at the amounts that Australia is investing in AI in general, you know, we're talking of the the order of thirty million dollars mm. Australian, and but you compare that to Germany or France or South Korea, and those numbers are just dwarfed. You know, you're into the into the billions mm. with some of those country, countries. So we, I think I think we punched above our weight here in Australia, is what I would say. Great. Um, Let's see, Catherine. This is a question specifically for you. So it's kind of building on the discussion that we've been having about. Um, AI adoption in industry, and in particular, Yashvir is talking about the adoption of AI in the energy industry. And the question is, you know, is it is it really making a huge impact already, or is it still in, still in its infant stage? Or if I was to ask that question in a slightly different way, you know, is it all promises for potential things that can happen, or or is the energy industry already changed because of AI? And if so, in what ways? I would say. Um is still in the infant stage. Yeah. Still in the infant stage. Yeah, and I think you know the I. Um, so I'll tell. What I can say is, that's is, Australian energy market is very unique, and um, maybe there are a lot of actually competitors in this field from overseas, from US, and want to enter the Australian market as well. And there are certain things where certainly in different area in different stream, and you can implement, you can actually have the idea and to build it up. However, to make it on the enterprise level, and it is 
the way I think we still have a way to go. Great, excellent. I'm going to move to this question by Richard because I think this is an interesting question. I also think it's a good question to go to because he starts this question with great webcast. <laughs> and as you know, we like questions that start like that. So Richard's actually asking about end user programming. So he's saying, you know, um, uh, to get AI up and running, is it always going to require AI experts who can do the coding and have those programming skills? Or do you think we're going to get to a stage where we're going to have some kind of, you know, WYSIWYG type, um, easy to use interfaces so that, you know, people who are maybe not so skilled in programming can actually um, put together um, at least fairly simple AI applications. Mm. Do you see that that's going to be a development in the future, Ray? I do, actually. I think it's probably going to be easier to allow regular folk to do AI development than it, than it is to allow regular folk to do hardcore software engineering, mm. because we know that is always going to be a very deep technical skill. But with AI, there's a lot of architecture. It's like Lego, putting bits together and running it, collecting data, observing it, training. So there's, uh, to a degree, there's a, an element that I think uh, people can do. We see that with our, with our students too. Students with a modern AI system can do a lot more than they could 20 years ago. Um, they don't need to do two years of heavy duty mathematics before they're useful. Mm -hmm. With the modern tools, they can start producing decent AI systems fairly quickly. Mm, so it's going to get easier and easier. Yeah. And here's a, sorry, did you want to add to anything to that? Oh, I, I, I would say I completely agree, especially the Lego piece analogy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so, I would say, well, um, thanks for the open, you know, community where you know that's um, where people you you used to write thousands of lines of code. Mm. Now you can actually visit that AI algorithm. You write maybe 20, 30, 40 lines of code, and then you can package it up and it's just like this Lego piece. Mm. And there are many people use it and contribute and to make it reusable and test it. Then you can actually. In a higher level, mm. you know, and it so may have a, a megabyte of, or a gigabyte of data attached to it. Yeah, so, yes. Know, Sample the, data already <laughs> cross-sourced yeah, yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. So there's, yeah. There, it's not just that small amount of code that makes it work. Yes, <laughs> exactly. What about this question? This is a good one. Um, sp any sports fans here? Oh, yeah. A little bit. What's <laughs> your sport, Ray? Uh, I, I've dabbled in all sorts of things. I'm not good at any particular. Sport watching I, maybe so, well I'll watch a bit of rugby uh, ah rugby I've got a rugby fan I do I'm, like swimming I'm, I'm a soccer fan Catherine yeah. any particular favorite sport uh, well um I I'm watching uh, often badminton but badminton. I'm a swimmer ba and badminton swimming rugby football Arham asks us what's the potential of machine learning in sports oh okay so you, you know what if you had a, a computer that was playing the violin, you'd wonder, I don't know, it's lost its human element. I, uh, so we know that, that they could be very good and they, just, they could be designed to be ultra fast. Is it worth it? That's the question I would. But presumably would they're already, I mean, that's, that's getting, you know, robots to play sport. Yeah. There's the, the famous RoboCup, of course, but yeah. presumably they're already ma using machine learning in, in, in optimizing performance of athletes and collecting data that's how, the how soccer players yeah. move around yes. the field. And so then, the, you know, all the big soccer teams now, well, some of them at least have AI systems same with the uh, uh, automobile racing or the Formula um, Formula One has AI in the background. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So there are two types where I um, I think that's a fascinating. One is that the Formula One, mm. which mm. is that the uh, sports uh, mechanical um, engineering, mm. which mm. is enabled by the large volume of uh, that's you know analytics, yeah. sports analytics. However, I recently just saw this fencing. So the fencing, actually, oh. they use uh, fencing with the video, actually, the video, because fencing, they had a lot of um, issue where 
the judge make the wrong oh. call. Mm. And uh, then, the, however, they used the video, uh, you know, the image recognition. And then they had, a, you look it up, that's really fascinating. And uh, with um, the trajectories of oh. that's uh, where uh, the tipping the point, yeah. and uh, whether uh, at a certain, uh, you know, point of time, there is the who touched who. and at, then they were uh, made it a fair call. So far, they say, okay, we can use this not only for just the watching it. It's like beautiful, like you know, drawing, and then plus we can give a fair judgment, and then plus we can use that data for the performance, yeah. you know, analytics and how you're going to improve your techniques. I think fantastic. that's a, yeah, yeah, fantastic. So maybe a final question to to wrap this all up from me. So we've. We've covered quite a broad range of different topics and in particular different industries this evening. So we've talked about sports and AI, we've talked about, uh, we talked about driverless vehicles, we've talked about, of course, AI and energy and, uh, and, uh, and, and suicide prevention. It, it seems like AI is everywhere, mm. but we've also talked about the ethics of AI. So Ray and Catherine, as a final thought, are there any industries or any areas where AI shouldn't go? Wow. Um, I'm going to say that's a, that's a difficult one because I can always see an AI acting as a support, mm. even if they shouldn't be there in the front line. Mm. You know, I'm thinking of a psychologist, for instance, or a social worker. That's a very human activity. Mm -hmm. But they could be using a, an AI to suggest things in the background. Catherine, anywhere AI shouldn't go? Oh, I completely agree. <laughs> and I, I, I cannot foresee, at least right now, in which area AI shouldn't go. But is how we're going to, you know, augment it, the mm. AI as our assistance. And at the somewhere it's in danger, we put them in front, right? And then we can put the robot into the you know, on the moon and on, you know, mm. in certain tasks people cannot do. Sure. However, I, I think AI has a great potential. Yeah. So I think the, the, uh, the, the, the key message from the, this evening's panel, folks, is that AI can be everywhere, it should be everywhere, but only if it's used responsibly mm. and in a way that is not necessarily replacing humans, but supporting humans. Yeah. Look, we've come to the end of what I think has been a very um, exciting and interesting discussion this evening. So I would like to thank the panelists, Ray Buntin and uh, Catherine Lopez. Um, right. Before we head off, I just want to um, uh, mention a couple of quick things um, to everyone out there. If you want to explore more about what is happening in, in everything to do with the world of AI, then you should check out our recently launched um, AI portal. It's called Monash Futurist Inside AI. Just put that into Google. Um, we've got a range of lots of really interesting stories um, on there that are very easily accessible. Um, and if you are actually you know, in Australia and you want to learn more and get educated more in AI, just to tell you that the faculty of Mon at Monash, the Faculty of Information Technology, is starting a new Masters of uh, Artificial Intelligence um, next year. And if you're a Monash University alumni, you can get a 10% discount on that Masters. So what, what, what a great deal that is. And the link to all of these is available in the document folder. We would love to hear your feedback on this webcast, so you'll be receiving an email asking you to evaluate the event, submit any further questions. Please look out for that, and it will also contain a link to the recording if you'd like to watch it again or share it across your networks. Please do so. We'll be hosting future webcasts and Monash Tech Talk series in the future, so again, please uh, keep an eye out for those. But for now, finally, on behalf of Monash University, I'd like to say once again a big thank you to Ray and Catherine and we hope that we will see you all next time. Goodbye. Thank you for having Bye. me. Bye.